Um, sweet. Well, it's it's great to see such a um, a nice turnout um, coming right back from a, a holiday and all, and seeing uh, a lot of film, familiar faces and seeing some new faces also. Um, but uh, but yeah, welcome welcome to our weekly roundtable um, kind of meeting. I'm Alex. I'm the host and moderator. Um, and what we're gonna do tonight, if if Andrew is is up for it, Andrew had presented an idea a couple of weeks ago um, to kind of go through a some sort of exercise, or I'll, I'll let him kind of get into it more over text sheets. We thought that it would be helpful um, for for text. Um, you know, these calls are recorded and a lot of people will watch um, the calls at a later time. Um, so I think that what we'll do, Andrew, if you're if you're up for it, we'll start out with the little, um, I'll be able to share my screen, pull up that text sheet, and then I'll, I'll hand you the mic. And then um, we can just kind of shift uh, into some open discussion sort of uh, naturally from there. I'm fighting reception. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So being that it's our first time, I really don't necessarily have a you know great format for it, but I can give it a whirl. Uh, this is a basic uh, Frigidaire dishwasher, probably the most common dishwasher maybe in the North American continent. Everybody's seen it a hundred times. Um, this is big enough. For generally, you you're going to arrive and you're going to question the board, right? Are you getting power to a certain component? Uh, it's the only reason you probably pull this text sheet out. Otherwise, you can diagnose pretty much everything just by pressing the start button darn near. Um, so for example, you might come in on a, a no heat claim. The customer says it's not heating and this text sheet's gonna go, you know, uh, it's gonna walk you through the entire process. I personally wouldn't even pull my meter out. I'd go straight to this section. If you see the water service test, Alex, are you able mm -hmm. to zoom in on that at all? Yeah, let's see. So that water service tester diag mode, I'm sure everybody's familiar with it. I'd love to get feedback. Does anybody have any major questions right off the top, or should I just kind of walk through it? I'm not. Go ahead. I've not seen it before. You can go ahead. Oh, cool. Okay, so this dishwasher is super simple. It's a pretty standard uh, single speed wash pump. Um, external heater, so it will heat the water uh, as well as the air. Um, it probably does not have a uh, vent on it anymore, at least the newer ones don't. And uh, you're all familiar with the standard, you know, timed fill and things like that. It really doesn't run off of amperage or anything like that as far as the motor goes. It's going to be a timed fill. But when you go to this diag mode, you can read it right there. Um, press the uh, options and start pad for one second in the power failure mode or... I don't think you can do it outside of power failure. So you have to cut the power, put the power back on, and then you would press the options and start pads for one second to get it into that diag mode. So we're gonna worry about the, the heating cycle of it. So in order to get to the heat, in order to get to the, to find out if the heater is gonna work without pulling the meter out, you're just gonna press that start pad until you get to the eighth step, which is drain and dry heat. That eighth step is gonna kick that heater on uh, sorry, getting some messages in the background. It's going to kick that heater on and you would leave the door closed until the heater's been on for, I don't know, five to 10 seconds, just long enough that you can feel the heat coming off of it. If you don't feel heat, then obviously you'd move on to figure out, is it getting power? Are, are you losing power somewhere or do you have a bad heater? Uh, that's where the schematic kicks in. So we're going to zoom in on that schematic that uh, just to the right of where you're looking now, Alex, there's a big picture of a bunch of lines. Okay, so that entire upper section is your control board, that, that top rectangle, that main large rectangle is your control board. So pretty much everything comes off of that control board and everything goes back to the neutral, uh, the line neutral part of your input power, supply power. You can kind of see how it starts at the top. So for instance, on the far left, you'll see the heater. It'll start from the control board on P, P8 is going to supply line voltage or 120 volts AC. And then to neutral, no matter where you touch at a neutral, you should find that when that 
heater is turned on, you'll get 120 volts off of P8 to neutral. And with this example, we're, we're still going to be using diagnostic mode because we know that step eight of that water service test or diag mode is going to give power to that heater. It will also give power to your drain motor, but your heater is what we're worried about. So we would test from P8. We would put our lead on P8, and then we would go to neutral anywhere. Uh, there you can find a neutral on your control board. You can find neutral on the door switch. You can find neutral quite a few places when you're up there in that control board area. And if your control board does send 120 volts, well, you know that your power is going to the motor or to the heater rather. So that's a pretty simple diagnosis if your control board's working or not. Now you'd have to run down to your heater. So to get to the heater is a little bit difficult on this particular machine. So it's easiest to just take, uh, uh, I don't think it's real easy to get to the heater because the connections are in the back, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Or, no, they're on the right side of this one. So you take your, your kick, pad, kick panel off and you get your leads on the actual heater, which in this case, I believe are red and white, just like it says. They might be red uh, with a white tracer and white, but nonetheless, you'd be on that heater. And still in diagnostic mode, you would check for power across those leads. Hopefully you're getting that same power down there as you are off the board. I assume everybody's done it this way, but that's a simple process of, you know, walking through a, that schematic in this particular case. You should be able to determine if, if you're getting power to your heater, your heater's not working, clearly you have a bad heater. I usually so that's a pretty easy one. I'm sorry? I usually jump to the thermostat. Yeah, the thermostat might be a little bit easier to get to. Um, and you can definitely come off the backside of the thermostat too, but with this particular dishwasher and just for the example's sake, uh, coming off of that heater is just as easy. You can get to it pretty easy. Do um, you have any more input on that, Bobby? Come on, I need help with this. <laughs> I was, I was, I'm I was, not a teacher. I was chiming in, but I kept myself muted. And I was letting you do your thing, man. No, I, I think probably the majority of us here are pretty clear on how to uh, read this simple, simple schematic. Yeah, uh, but... Uh, maybe you come in and your and your complaint says not washing properly. That's and the one you want to verify. What's that? That's the one with the thermostat up in the upper right, or is it on the on the left, like towards the middle? So I believe your heater comes down on the right side to get to the connections, and I think the thermostat is behind the heater, if I'm not mistaken. Most of those are like right there towards the front middle, you know, sections. It's either on the right side, up tucked up in there, uh, to, up to the right, or it's in the front, right above the valve, uh, just a, about three inches back. Yeah, I can't recall. Regardless, we're not uh, necessarily concerned so much with the the thermostat in this particular uh, the thing. We're just assuming that the thermostat's good. Uh, we're going straight to the heater to determine is it the board or is it the heater. Right. With that, you know, example. When I go into that diagnostics mode, I go right to there and then I go to the neutral on the terminal block and then I put my lead right to that thermostat. So that one test right there tells me is there voltage running to the control board and then I can go to the other side of the thermostat and confirm that voltage is going through which tells me that that thermostat is working good. So with that one test right there in diagnostics, I've eliminated the control board and the thermostat which uh, leaves obviously the one thing left which is the heater. So you, you simplifying your steps by you're dividing the circuit in half. That's exactly how I do it too, because you're at least covering your thermostat, like you said, and your control at the same time. If you go straight to the heater, you could have a bad thermostat and it can give you a false and make you think that your control is faulty. Correct. Yeah, there's a good chance that I'm not laying down on my side to get to any of those things before I start off the control board though. And if I'm gonna lay down, I'm gonna go straight to the heater uh, personally, but... Um, it's that's definitely a, a, a technique doesn't matter which way you do it it's a matter of getting it done i just don't tend to use the thermostat i don't see that thermostat fail and i know that the heater is what i'm after um, i do see the heater fail and then i do see the control board failed but i rarely see that thermostat failed it's just you know unlikely so so uh, i took a sick so I took like a six year break and ran my company, but then I had to hop back out there. So yeah, the last time I was out there, Frigidaire dishwasher would have the vent. So are all the new Frigidaires, you have to kill the power and then put it into diagnostic? Because 
I neglected to read that and could not put a board into diagnostic. Yeah, you got to run so, down and trip the breaker and then run back up. You got to do that on all the new Frigidaires. Otherwise, it won't go into Not diagnostic. all of them, but many of them. So I just have to read um, the directions carefully. See, you were assuming that earlier, Andrew. Like, it's a standard, standard thing, but I, I, I must have missed that. Now I have to check that, that machine out that I worked on because I couldn't get it into diagnostics. So I thought it's got to be a bad board. That's why it's stopping in the middle of the cycle. But yeah. it kicked my butt because it was a bad board. Bobby, I wouldn't run down to the breaker either. I disconnected off the board. Oh. Just pop that hot right off the board. That actually is I mean, a that's going to put it in power failure mode too. That's a really good point. What's that? You, I said that is a really good point. You can do that. I was always uh, just taught that you know not disconnect a live circuit and then jump it back on. But it's it's virtually the same thing. You you are right. You're 100 percent right on that. Yeah. Uh, the other way, if I don't feel like going all the way to the board because I've got a tech sheet with me rather than opening up the door, um, I would do it off the supply terminal. Uh, just you know, I twist my wire nut right off and bam, uh, it's cutting power right now. That's assuming that you don't have a power switch right there on the wall, which is code here. Um, Ninety percent of the stuff I work on has a power switch. So most of what we we see down here is going to be hardwired line in, you know. And it, there's it, sometimes you're going to get one that's tied into the uh, garbage disposal, you know, like the raw the raw 120. So when you disconnect the uh, the breaker downstairs, your garbage disposal and your dishwasher are usually tied on the same circuit. We have a standard light switch. Is code here? for all new construction after like 1990 or something. So that, that, that light switch on the wall will cut the power to the dishwasher. Um, that's, you, that's in addition to the garbage disposal light switch. That's pampering. We don't have that here. Well, I don't, I'm in St. Louis. It's been Ohio code for 30 years. Uh, but neither here nor there. We're gonna go back to the schematic here. Uh, hopefully Alex can get back in there. Um, but the standard complaint for a, a Frigidaire dishwasher, everybody's heard it a thousand times, I'm sure, is it doesn't wash my dishes. <laughs> uh, it's really not that great of a dishwasher, right? So um, it's probably not meeting their needs more than anything. But to verify its operation, um, I wouldn't use diagnostic mode for this or the water service test. I would personally use the, the start button and just start a cycle. Uh, pick whatever cycle I want, but um, generally I'm gonna pick like a normal cycle and uh, start that dishwasher and let it go. Hopefully it goes into a drain for uh, 30 seconds or so. Sometimes it's like two minutes. It can be a really long drain mode depending on what it wants to do. Uh, then hopefully we're gonna watch it fill and we're gonna watch it go into um, circulation, which is gonna be with that uh, circ pump. But then we get to circulation and we see that the water is full, but there's no motor movement. So it's really not washing. Customer's not lying to you this time. Uh, with this particular pump motor, we're lucky because it is a 120 volt pump motor. Uh, same concept with that uh, with that heater. Uh, we should be getting power right off the board, and it should be going uh, to any neutral anywhere. So that blue wire P35, uh, kind of the second third of the uh, right side there. Yep, perfect. Uh, so if we're coming right off the board, that's great. Um, but I'm only seeing 90 volts coming off that board, uh, which is a kind of a weird complaint, but it definitely happens. Uh, any examples or any uh, reasoning for anybody to think why there would be 90 volts coming off that board and the pump won't work? Cool, uh, 90 volts is a weird one because you're likely getting 120 volts coming from the supply line. Your fill valve worked and it should range anywhere from 90 to 140 for most fill valves, uh, but that motor just won't turn. So we're gonna get 90 volts coming off of that motor. We can't tell if it's the board or if it's the motor at that point because uh, the motor's not getting full power. Um, does anybody have any good propositions to how we can test that motor? Um, knowing that that board only gives us 90 volts? Cheater cord. What are you gonna, you're gonna cut the wires and run a cheater cord? I'll unplug it directly and, and plug it uh, right, on, right onto that line. But usually it's gonna be loaded down though, correct? The motor's gotta be loaded down, is that what you're saying? No, you're, you're saying uh, having the 90 volts, usually it's because the motor's seized up and it's loading down the voltage. Oh, 
Uh, no, in this particular case, it's a bad relay coming off the board. It's just not giving me full power. Um, but the way I would do it personally is kind of a really strange way. But I know that that, that heater again, it's gonna give me a voltage in my test eight. And I know that my relay is bad on my board. So what I would personally do is I would run test eight and take power directly off that board from the heater terminal and uh, flop them over. Um, cheater cord would work, but I'm not cutting wires, but I will jump a wire. Uh, I don't know. I was just curious if anybody's ever done it that way. If it's spade terminal. Come right off that board from uh, the heater term. What's that? If it's, uh, if there's spade terminals connecting to that motor, the same like on the connecting to that uh, water valve, uh, if it's a, like a uh, specific type, you know, like a, a design plug, it makes it a little harder. But if it's spade terminal yeah. connectors, yeah, I, I, I slap a cheater cord right on it and just use the alligator clips on the cheater cord. And it, you know, it, it's not that hard at all. Yeah. In this particular case, it is a spade terminal coming off that, uh, off that heater. They run the heater off of a spade terminal off the board, but the motor's coming off of a, like a Molex plug. Uh, nine pin Molex plug or something like that. So I've, I've actually done that where I've taken a literally a jumper from the heater power terminal over to the nine pin plug disconnected from the board. And uh, I've had good success doing it that way. It's worked for me. But So is that something you guys see? Uh, uh, 90 volts or missing voltage from a, a half open relay? I have. Off this particular board, especially, I didn't have any really? good examples for this dishwasher. Off, off this schematic, there's really it, it's super easy. Uh, there's not a whole lot going on with this dishwasher. So after that, you're talking about filtration and you know, the, is the filter dirty? Are you getting enough water because of supply? Uh, the different oddball things or the normal things like that. But the schematic, uh, I just wanted to start somewhere simple and hoped everybody had questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does anybody have any questions? I'd love to. Go over it some more. Um, the most common thing we're going to see on a dishwasher is going to be a drain pump, right? Water valve and drain pump. Uh, I don't see water valves very often, but I do see drain pumps all the time. Um, the majority of the drain pumps I touch on, I'm here in Hum, uh, which is kind of a neat example. Um, a humming drain pump kind of indicates that it's getting power. Right. Uh, so you kind of have to figure out, is it jammed or is it... Uh, is it a bad motor? And I don't know about you guys, but I rarely see bad drain motors out of um, most anything anymore. The motors aren't failing. It's either the impeller stripped off the actual motor or it's jammed. Yep. Um, I don't check power to a humming drain motor anymore. There's no, there's no diagnosing there. It's pulling the actual drain motor out uh, is really all I'm doing. Right? Hey, I had a uh, Preston dishwasher. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Hey, it's not a frigid air, but I had a whirlpool on Tuesday. I uh, wouldn't drain, and uh, I pulled the drain line off uh, under the sink, and I couldn't get anything coming through it. With uh, I just hooked up a shop back that happened to be there, and I couldn't get anything through it disconnected it from the pump and, and pulled through and I, I had a, a clear line for the drain. And then uh, I, I heard the pump running. So I took the pump loose and the pump was spinning, but with nothing in it, no obstructions blocking it, it wouldn't pump water out. But I uh, kind of tapped the propeller with my finger and it kept stopping. I, I figured maybe, uh, a weak pump, so I, I wouldn't think it would stop so easily. Any ideas? Yeah, I've got one specifically for most. That's what I was saying before. By the way, Alex, I'm all done with that schematic. That, that was 20 minutes. So I think we did all right there. Um, the most common thing I see with most drain pumps nowadays is the impeller strips off of the shaft of the motor. So that's why when you were just barely touching it, you were giving it enough force to stop that uh, impeller. Do you know if it was the shaft stopping or if it was the impeller stopping? Uh, I feel like it was just the impeller because it sounded like it was still going. Yeah, that that may be could, it. Do you know if you do you know if you could pull that impeller off that shaft? Did you try? I, I didn't know that was something you could do. 
I, I'm still kind of uh, new. Shouldn't to be able to, but right. I, I mean, I didn't. It didn't fall off or anything. I mean, it wasn't loose, but yeah. I didn't try to pull it. I see that a ton with Samsung washing machines. I think that's one of the most common things I see with the Samsung pumps. Well, is, is that something you could fix with a pump or just replace it? I don't fix water things. They re, they get replaced. Right, right. That's what I recommended as well. I see it with Bosch dishwashers quite often too. They have the old good. ones. Even some of the new ones, they have a fairly inexpensive drain pump. And um, if there's no obstructions in there, I've had some that uh, will drain while I'm there, but then clients call me back saying it's not draining again, not draining again. Um, it will drain kind of eight out of 10 times kind of thing. Are most of those newer Bosch's 12 volts, not 120? So I guess it depends on the model, uh, but yeah, uh, could very well be. I hate Bosch. Just <laughs> I thought they were 24. Are they 12 or are they 24? Do you know? I thought they were, I know the one, the one I was working on was 12 because that was when I was uh, with a different company. I actually called Bosch to go through it because it, I couldn't, it wasn't making sense. Come to find out whenever the drain pump wasn't running, there was 12 volts, but whenever the pump was loading down, the voltage was coming off and falling off the control board. It was a pain in the butt, and Bosch likes to think everyone's got little tiny three-inch hands. I hate that. It's my favorite dishwasher on the market. It's the only one I recommend, and it's the only one I'll put in my kitchen. I, I'll do the same thing and recommend them, but I just hate working on them. I got stumped with an LG inlet valve that was a 12-volt valve I wasn't aware of. Um, but one of you guys on the forums helped me out. I was expecting 120. I've never seen a 12 volt in a valve, and that's what it was 12 volt in a valve. Client bought the part, I just installed it. Sure enough, you bought the wrong part. Always go on the model, not by YouTube. <laughs> that's right. I love when that happens. So just for the record, Andrew, I think that that was an excellent little tech sheet rundown. And um, I'm going to segment it out and I'm going to put the video out in the Facebook group because I think a lot of people are going to find that helpful. And um, and uh, yeah, so, so thank you for that. I think you're a great teacher. Um, wow. I want to know what are you guys expecting coming up in the future. This has been an, um, and feel free to just unmute and jump in and I'll manage mics if I need to, but this has been a different year. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, most markets, you guys are get, usually going into the slow time of year. Uh, what are you expecting and, or what are you doing to prepare or, or whatnot? Stocking up on parts. I was just gonna say the same thing. What kind of parts, guys? Every, How are you stocking up on anything right now? World. You know, I, that's what I'm saying. The stuff that I would be ordering one or two of, I'm ordering 10 of instead of one or two. Because when they come in, I want to be ready and I want to have those parts on hand for, you know, future calls. I can't get a 341241 at my supply house right now. So TK, are you saying or are you implying that you're not expecting things to slow down for you or am I hearing this a little differently? I was saying that parts are becoming more and more less available. Mm -hmm. My supply house has 1,500, 341, 241 belts on order right now and they don't have any in stock. Supply is not meeting demand. Up. Yeah. Supply is definitely not meeting demand. What are your guys' senses? I mean, do you think that demand is going to be decreasing some? No. no. I think demand's going to stay the same and availability of parts, like TK said, is what's going to be freaking killing us and taking out the guys that aren't thinking ahead. The scarier our economy is, increase. the better our business does. People are probably going to lean more towards repairs now because if you know if they're dealing with layoffs, they're better off repairing. Also, availability. I hear fridges uh, up here, January, February. Some of them are July, so people are saying, "You know what, fix it for five, six hundred bucks. I don't care. Just patch me up until I can get a new one in July." A lot of the two thousand mentality is playing in our favor too, because a lot of people want matching appliances, 
and uh, they don't want to go get that one off because they can't get a whole kitchen right now. So they don't want to go buy that one off appliance. Uh, they're going to have that one off fixed instead of looking at buying a new one because they want them all to match still. No, it's a weird good. mentality to me, by the way. Uh, if one appliance doesn't match, that's not a big deal. If your washer doesn't match your dryer, so what? Yeah. But uh, <laughs> that's the way people think right now. I think the uh, used appliance uh, and refurbished appliance game is going to be huge in the next few years, next few months, however long it, it's going to be because people can't find appliances and a lot of people aren't going to have the money to buy new appliances and they're going to be looking for used stuff. And the, the reputation of the new stuff is so bad. They want to find old stuff. Yep. Is it yeah, are people finding that money slow? I mean, are you finding that a lot of your customers can't afford to pay for the repairs that you're diagnosing? Um, I was just going to ask that. If I've not had money complaint all year. Nobody's complained about money all year. No, same here. Have you guys been finding that you're getting a um, uh, part that is no longer available or not available? Like, let's just use Marcone uh, Whirlpool Control Board. Marcone's got 944 on order. Um, no, you know, they, they're like, oh, we can't get it for a month, but you look on Amazon, you can get it here by Sunday. Yep. Yep. The yeah. Amazon buying stuff up. Yep. About one last week. I just had to buy two I've not parts. experienced that, but that's crazy. I just uh, had oh. two, two parts and I can actually give you the part numbers because I'm looking right at them. They don't have them anywhere else, but I was able to get them through Amazon instantly. Do yeah, seven. The case the example was the Whirlpool like belt. Crazy. My big issue has been the four roller uh, dryer kits. I just got yeah. we, we ordered like go 10 four roller dryer kits and they came in generic and the fuckers didn't work. I just got two of the, um, I'm sorry, six of the two wheel kits. Yeah. Yeah, I have five of them. Were they Whirlpool order right now? Yes, they were the Whirlpool original two wheel belt kit. Huh. So here's the part that uh, I just had, to, I just came across and had to deal with it. It's a uh, uh, Wendy 10103. 10240, the Whirlpool control board. And according yeah. to them, they have 944 on order through Lenexa, and they're supposed to be getting them in, but they keep backdating it. Wasn't able to get it. Um, Reliable says it's a special order item, seven to 10 days, but I was able to get it through Prime. Ain't that some shit. If you plug in the exact same part number, but with 1695 at the end, I find that that board works exactly the same. And there may be stock of that and it's cheaper. Yeah, the universal for that board is actually you just put an A on the end of it. And that was what makes it universal to like 16 different boards. Hmm. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that either until um, I got schooled by uh, Marcone. Hmm. Hey, I looked up my warehouse for the 341241. They've got about 400 of them in stock and over a thousand on order. They got 400 in stock? Yeah, over 400, probably closer to five. That's uh, great. Yeah, I, might four. Need to, <laughs> I might need to get a couple of them. Mm -hmm. isn't, this the, isn't this the toilet paper conundrum where yeah. we go and buy a whole bunch and then they, we start to have a supply issue? If we don't have the, the supply people buying it, like, you know, going into Schnooks and there's a thousand customers a day, you know, picking it up. It's just because of their reduced staff. Uh, like most of the reps and the people I've been talking to, they're running at 25% capacity. So, I mean, it's, it's pushing out less and less. I mean, have you guys seen what Marcone is doing? They're basically not going to stock the stuff or they can't get it right away, but they're just charging us an extra 30 for, well, Whirlpool's charging us an extra 30 to expedite a uh, direct ship from Whirlpool. Have you guys seen that on Mark Owen's page? I have. So I think that's just sort of the temporary thing for, since Mark Owen can't get large volume is just kind of be the middleman from Whirlpool Direct to try to speed it up. But I, my rep said that it isn't going to speed it up any faster. It just means you get put at the top of the list of a regular order. So you'll probably get it in two weeks for 30 bucks. Right. So it's all about script. It's all about scripting to your customer 
much to, you know, blame COVID, but say, hey, take a look at my Marcon screen. There it is. This is the reality. Um, and we have to kind of deal with it, right? And I also, I also heard that Marcon is no longer accepting um, wholesale customer, uh, you know, contracts anymore. Yeah, they haven't done that in a year. Oh, really? Yeah, the, you you have to be a dealer or a wholesaler um, the, to be able to order parts. They're no, they're no longer open to the public. No, that's what I'm saying. They're not taking any new wholesalers on right now. That makes sense. I applied uh, three weeks ago. I ain't heard nothing from them yet. The other thing that with Marcone is on their disclaimer for their shipping, they'll um, uh, you if you order something and let's say you expedite the shipping and it doesn't happen, um, they are not refunding shipping because of they're blaming COVID and that's not their problem. All right, right. Does anybody um does anybody do Viking? Yeah, I'm sorry, real quick. Are you guys using your local guys more because of the Viking and national crisis? Or do you find that you're not using your regional local guys more? I can't, I can't get shit from my local guys. Well, Viking is going to be a privileged, you know, distributor usually most of the time. I usually use Great Plains or uh, um, uh, what's the other one? Summit for Viking. There's one other one. But I, I meant for your everyday middle of the road stuff. Are you using your local distributor more frequently? For most general orders, most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. What's going on with Viking, Bailey? I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking. I had, I had, uh, I had a problem with, um, this built-in ice maker, and I can't find a I can't find a control board for this uh for this uh microwave. Oh, he's a cable Can't find it nowhere, man. My even my 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 part supplier can't even find it. You can't find the part number, or you can't find availability. No, I can't find the the, the part the, the the part for the uh. For the microwave, it's the control board. Can't find it. I do, mean, do you, have, I, I, do you, do you have a part number? Right. Yeah, yeah. Hold on. <clears throat> so what are you guys doing right now the most of? Uh, ovens and dishwashers right now in this season? Yeah, pretty much. Well, I've been a pretty good answer. I've been so, getting a streak of sealed systems lately. I've done maybe 10 sealed systems in the past, you know, 10 days. Here's the model number. V model or part? Yeah, part number. Did, did oh, you did you are you having a hard time finding the part number or or you can't find availability? I have, I can, we can't I can't can't even find the part number. All right, can you throw it in the chat, the, the model number, and then I'll try to help out? Sure. All right, thanks. Say it out loud, too. Huh? Say the model number out loud. Can you see that? No, no. I can't make no. that out. No, you got to type it out and, and say it out, man. All uh, right. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. VM, 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 zero R two zero five SS, and that's your microwave. Yeah, and you're looking for the the main control board for it. Yeah, yeah, the main control okay. board. It's 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 two. It's 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 two that. Two boards they attach to each other. It just folds over, so it's part going to number, be the relay board. And... Huh? Part number. Are you ready? Oh, hold on, Bailey. Sure. Do you have a pen and a paper? Yeah, I'm getting it now. Hold on, give me a second. Oh. Get your Mastercard my... out too. Why <laughs> 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 
All right, let's go. P is in Papa. M is in Michael. One zero 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 eight seven. I cannot get you a price, but that is your part number. eBay. Okay. PM one zero zero eight nine. No, PM one zero 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 eight seven. It's three zeros. One zero 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 eight seven. Just still thinking a little bit about Alex's question. Today, um, I wondered if it may slow down and not hired a bunch of new technicians, if I should jump into the warranty realm a little bit. Um, You're right about that. Maybe, maybe a boutique brand like, like Fisher Paco or something like that to generate a few extra calls. Does anybody you guys do warranty work? I'll I just the... end up with Viking. I have them actually knock. I have a bunch of ones knocking at my door. This is Italian oven uh, called an aisle or an uh, uh, S deal or something like that. And they had one out here in uh, like on the outskirts of my area and they wanted me to go do a thermal coupler and a uh, control board. They're going to send me the part, but their rate was going to be like a hundred bucks. And I was like, no, too far, not worth it. And that's too high end of a um, range to do for a hundred bucks. No, thanks. I think it's LV, I-L-V-E. Yeah, there you go. Italian brand? I don't know. There's not many of them out there, but they're easy to work on. Yeah, well, he wanted to uh, uh, pay out a hundred bucks. And I was like, ah, oh, dude, that's extended service area. No, thanks. Hey, Doug, I'm curious. Um, what kind of, you know, you're talking about thinking you're, thinking about um, taking on maybe some warranty work in an effort to, um, you know, offset a potential drop or ultimately, you know, to, to keep the business level at where you're wanting it. I mean, I'm curious, what are you doing right now for getting your current flow of leads? Well, we, we were, we were uh, Google AdWords and uh, one leads based guy throwing some websites out there and then of course covid hit so in we we were booked out two weeks from march through you know going into the summer um so i shut off google ad leads and only kept that leads based guy so i didn't lose our relationship and we still were booked out two weeks but probably what's it's thanksgiving Probably at the end, the, the first week of November, I finally started to see certain areas come down to about a week out. And so I finally, I did turn my Google AdWords back on for a couple territories, and now we're back up to a week and a half. So, I mean, I lost technicians, I gained technicians, and I'm going to keep finding more. I'm going to just find them and train them. But I'm just concerned thinking that today I'm concerned as I'm training a brand new guy today, just hired him today. Um, maybe I should get into this warranty realm a little bit in case it does slow down January, February, March. When you so, say warranty, are you more interested in manufacturer warranty or third party warranty? I would probably just do manufacturer because the, uh, the, the extra benefit of getting the tech support would be helpful. So Right now, I'm, I'm pretty much COD, although fortunately, Bosch doesn't need our help too much in Connecticut, but I've been Bosch authorized for a year and a half, and I think I've done like eight calls. But what a blessing it is to have Bosch tech support and their website available. So um, now I'm thinking about maybe something else where, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just thinking, I'm asking, thinking off you, Alex, do yeah. we anticipate we quickly thought that maybe we won't have a slowdown in January, but what if it does? What if it does hit? Yeah. You know, are you uh, able to Lux tell? Frigid air is high volume. Yeah, and I'm a little afraid to go all in in warranty because it's not our model. But you know, that's why I'm trying to get my toes wet with a little bit of a little bit here and there. I heard like I'm almost LG authorized. 
Um, I think the owner has to get a tattoo of LG on the on his ass or something like that for the last step. Uh, but uh, the guy, I know the guy, and he's already told me refuse the work and take the tech support. So that's my plan for LG. But I could then once start to do some LG calls if I really need it, you know. And I'm curious, have you, were you able to, or, or would you be able to um, identify the amount of leads that your lead guy was bringing in, the amount of leads that your Google ads is bringing in, and then you're going to have a third one, which is really the amount of leads that neither of those lead generation channels are bringing in. Do you have that, that segmented visibility? Have you, are you able to pinpoint yeah. the why behind the down, the, the drop? I, I it all is all of them are tracked, Alex. But yeah. I'm not having a downturn yet. I'm just okay because I'm thinking one, that I'm, two weeks to one week, like trying to identify what happened in the lead flow that resulted oh, in the lead time, you know, getting cut in half. I, I just think that everybody's starting to slow a little bit, right? Okay. Every, you know what I mean? Like, you, when my CSRs, I'm listening to calls my CSRs are taking, and they're <clears> like. Yeah, my guy's booked out a month. My guy isn't answering his phone. Uh, he keeps saying he'll call me back. What does that mean? He's That one-man show is busy himself, right? Mm -hmm. I'm watching on Facebook. Everybody's been busy for a couple of weeks, but I got to believe everybody's starting to slow down a little bit, right? How about, right? Nope. Uh, Two weeks? I'm oh, really. <laughs> I thought we were going to slow down at the beginning of November, but it never happened. It, you know, we went down to three days out instead of eight, and uh, we're right back to eight and nine days out. Okay, and, and I'll take eight. Eight, eight. Isn't that weird? COVID. I mean, we're a we're a same day, next day company. That's how we've been for at least 15, 20 years. So when we were booking out eight or nine days, I'm sick to my stomach, right? So yeah, I, I mean. Yeah, right now in the, our oldest territory that we've been in since 1961, we're four days, five days out. But I turned Google AdWords on and it started to pick back up, you know. So I don't know. We're running a thousand to twelve hundred calls a week right now, between and ten guys. And you know yeah. where, where, where I'm, where I'm was trying to get through with right, get right. through with these questions is it's like. Is, and this is, this is a, a concept or a perspective that I think, you know, should ultimately it could apply to anywhere with any business owner in any business. It's like trying to identify the why. So let's say you dig in to the data or you talked with your lead providers and they're able to provide the information to try to understand if there's a correlation, because it's like, for example, you might see that the lead flow has reduced across one or some of those channels. And you can see that clearly, like when looking at month over month and going back um, mm -hmm. and, and looking at those months compared to the months that you're booked two weeks out, you see that month or that time period where you're one week out and trying to see, identify, all right, lead volume is down from one particular provider. Maybe there's something that can be done or maybe you know, dig in there. Or maybe for example, scenario number two, you look at the data and you see that the lead volume is consistent. So there, so the if the lead volume is consistent and if the amount of time that you're scheduling out is dropping down, then there's something in between there that um, would need to be uh, understood and addressed. Um, for example, sure. maybe sure, I get that. Maybe the for some reason the missed call rate is higher. Maybe there's issues with the phone system, and by the time your people mm -hmm. are calling them back, or are your people calling them back? Or how long is it taking for them to call you back? Maybe by the time that happens, if it does at all, they found somebody else. Because as you had mentioned, that is definitely um, something I've been hearing a lot of is on the phone, hey, um, the other person is booking out two weeks. Or hey, the other person's booking out a month. Or hey, we're not able to get to you for four days. You know. Oh, that's not going to work. Hey, could we recommend this person. Oh, they're booked out farther. You know that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, kind of like we know there's a bad onion. There's a bad spot in the onion. So it's like peel back the layers one bit at a time sure. to identify where it's where it's rotting. You know, that's that's a great big picture way of looking at it, Alex. It's, it's pretty critical. 
So you're right. Uh, our phone system will track. We have three queues. So you'll bounce down the queue. And if you hit the third queue, then it sends an email to our, to our office email that says that that customer went to voicemail and, and, and held out too long. And we do call them back. And we, and we actually track our success rate on calling them back. And, and it's actually pretty, pretty good because I think they recognize the phone number that, they, that we dialed in on. But yeah. uh, I think it got crazy busy when Home Depot and Best Buy said, I'm not bringing it in your house, the appliance. I can drop it at the edge of the driveway. That, those are the times that we were super busy in the spring and summer was when the option to buy new was almost off the table for the average customer. And we were their only option. So I think that, that, that one right there is starting to change a lot, I think, is why we're starting to slow. Because people start to have options again to buy new over, over repairing. Nice. Are you guys getting a lot of stock availability? Because uh, here it's still like you walk in there and you can see a you know the demo unit on the floor, but they give you a voucher for uh, and having it shipped in. It's usually seven to ten days. That's why, yeah, and people are now getting used to waiting for their new appliance because we sell too, but on a very small scale, maybe like fifty thousand a month, and and our customers are waiting seven to ten days for refrigerators and top load washers. And they're waiting, which is just mind blowing that they're waiting two weeks for service and a week for sales. But yes, yeah, stock's definitely an issue, right? I can only get GE top load washers. I can't get anything else right now. Um, one other thing I just want to mention, I've been thinking about a lot and talking about a lot in other areas and um, I think it's a really good tool to have in a business's tool chest when facing a situation similar to, you know, what Doug was talking about, where it's like, hey, might be, hey, we want to hire and make sure that we have um, a lever, essentially, to turn on, or we want there to be some dependability. And that is, and, you know, it sounds like Doug does a really great job of tracking all the little kind of different bits and metrics within the business which allows you to have those levers. And that's understanding the connection between the leads that you're generating. If, you know, in this example, we're talking about Google ads and lead providers. So it's like having that connection between the leads that you're bringing in and your, um, your actual, you know, dollars, your business. Because um, mm -hmm. if you have that clear association, um, it's like, hey, we're down to whatever threshold. We wanna be scheduling farther out you know, you have this lever that you can pull, um, you know, on average, if you're going to be spending so much on maybe advertising, for example, or whatever your lead source is, you can expect this much revenue. Um, and, uh, and yeah, you have to be tracking, you have to be tracking the kind of stuff that Doug was mentioning, you know, and more, but um, it can be very helpful. We've been tracking our can one report that we've been loving for years is our cancellation report. So every week we go into service desk, that's what we use for software, and we'll track all the booked appointments to those that canceled. And you have to put a reason in when the customer cancels. So the reasons that the customers cancel could be a lie or partly a truth or the truth. But what we've tracked now for like five years is like we, we are on the border of New York City. So that county in the busier season always fills up first. So as soon as we're booking past three days, our cancellation rate in that territory starts to spike. And so every week I have one of my CSRs printed, like last week, our cancellation rate was 38%. Again, that would be a whole bottle of cum for the week. That's 77 cancellations out of 208 booked appointments. So that's normally like a whole bottle of cums for me, okay? because four or five years ago, our cancellation rate in the slow season is like eight to 12%. And then in the summertime, it's like 25. And me and the owner are starting to get really frustrated. We start to shut off Google AdWords in those areas that we're, we're not able to keep those customers. Um, and it, it really blows up a schedule when, because people don't call and cancel with you. 
they keep the appointment and then they blow you off on the day you're trying to call. Even though Ross Ware sends email reminders that the appointment's coming. So anyway, 38% last week, guys. 77 appointments canceled. And of the 77, there was about a 15 that said, I found somebody sooner. So wow. that just tells me that my competition is slowing down. They're, they're either, you know, they're, they're scooping up those calls and, and we're, uh, and that's a lot of money to lose right there. So I'd love to get more texts so that my cancellation rate with, is, is nice and low, eight to 12% a week. And I think if you guys started tracking yours, you'll find that that's a pretty good norm, number. Like it started working. My husband fixed it. We changed our mind and bought new. Oops, I booked an appointment and so did my, my husband at, with a different company. There's legitimate cancellations. But right. um, if I hire guys, because now my ads are running and people are contacting me, what am I going to do? As Alex said earlier, in January, February, it does slow down. You know, Do I jump into warranty? Hey, I got the one question time? for you guys. Uh, what are you doing with uh, COVID cases? Uh, I'm sure you guys have all ran into them so far this season. Uh, we talked about it in the very beginning, but um, active calls, we are coming out. Are you guys screening? Do you do CDC guideline pre-screen? Um, or if a customer says that they, um, they just came off quarantine, are you asking for a negative result? Um, what are you guys doing for that? You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to make it that. You, you can't ask for a test result, but you yeah. can just make them wait two weeks, right? We just went back over our guidelines, which we do pre-screens just like uh, you're supposed to. And uh, we had somebody that was sick and diagnosed. They were, they had already been tested, but they hadn't gotten their results back. And then our technician was there the day before they got their positive results back. And uh, we're gonna change our pre-screen again to find out if anybody is currently being tested beyond just the, do you have symptoms and all the normal questions? Yeah, good call. So, good. I got, um, so I got a question for Alec real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so when so when you campaign do you do you campaign like individually or is it like shotgun type campaign or you know do you campaign for Frigidaire uh GE like a bunch of little uh, single campaigns or is it like just you know, like a shotgun effect. Like, how do you, like, what do you do? Are you referring to like advertising with Google ads? Yeah, or just, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, so with the Google ads, um, the way that the Google ads platform works is that somebody searches something in the search engine and that's called a search term. Um, and then an advertiser. So for example, if you were going to be utilizing Google ads to generate leads, you would be considered an advertiser. An advertiser assigns keywords in their account and ads. Um, and when somebody searches for that term, if you have a keyword that matches to what they searched for, your ad is eligible to show up. Um, now that's how the, that's the, um, like the basic function of the search marketing system um, to directly answer your question on my approach. And what I recommend is I always recommend um, a specific and relevant approach. So you were referring to shotgun. Shotgun means that if somebody searches, that means that an advertiser would use one type of ad and it's going to be their business name in the headline. And the message in the ad is going to be about the business. Um, which is good if the search intent is, is relevant to the brand. Are they looking for, you know, um, remind me, Bernard, what's the name of your company? Universal Appliance Repair. Cool. So if somebody use, types in Universal Appliance Repair Uni at the search term, um, and then your ad that's about your business, it says your business name, then that's a relevant message. But taking a shotgun approach where you use that same ad, across many different search terms, whether somebody's searching for appliance repair or refrigerator repair 
or an appliance repair in a specific city within your service area, and you're using the same ad to show up on all of that, that would be considered a shotgun approach. And that's something that I see in the majority of self-run Google ads accounts for like, you know, business owners, usually like one man shows, mom and pop shops, people that are managing in house. I usually see that they are taking a shotgun approach and you're going to get results, but the volume of leads that you get are gonna be lower and the cost of leads that you're gonna get are gonna be higher. Uh, now, what I advocate for in the What's way- we, Go ahead. No, I'm saying, no, sorry, go ahead. Um. Yeah, so what I always recommend in the way that we approach this is we approach being very specific where you will have a small set of keywords and ads that are going to be matched to the search term so that you can provide a very specific, relevant, and ultimately a helpful experience for whoever's searching. If somebody's searching for, so give me one of the cities um, that your company, uh, like one of your primary cities within your service area. Um, I, I service the five boroughs, okay. Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten cool. Island. So I'll use Brooklyn. My wife's from Brooklyn. Um, so if somebody's searching in Google and they type in refrigerator repair Brooklyn because they live in Brooklyn and they need the refrigerator repaired, taking a more specific approach, the opposite of a shotgun approach, you're going to have things built out in a way so that the ad says refrigerator repair in Brooklyn. The, the rest of the ad is talking about refrigerator repairs or your service or your experience or whatever around refrigerator repairs or in Brooklyn, you serve Brooklyn, that kind of thing. When they click on that ad, they're going to go to a landing page that is talking about refrigerator repair. I, I mean, yeah, you could take this really far and make hundreds of landing pages for all the combinations of cities and appliances. But point being, when they click on the ad, make sure that they're going to a page for refrigerator repair and they're not going to your homepage um, or they're not going to your general appliance repair page that isn't really talking too much about refrigerators. So. Um, that is a, a longer explanation to uh, taking a more specific approach or a shotgun approach.